Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, latest edition of On the Park Bench. We're just going to wait about 30 seconds um, as our attendees filter into the room. And once we have the nice critical mass, uh, we'll get going. So hello again, I'm Ben Crowther, and I want to welcome you to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress of New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is intended to be a and it tends to be weekly to provide a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing and emerging issues we're all facing right now. Let me know and let us know in, in the chat or the Q&A if you'd like to hear about something or from someone and we'll try to uh, line that up for future episodes in our series. Today's conversation is our first uh, since our summer hiatus and it is decoding DOT navigating transportation. Uh, but first, before we dive in, just want to give a few updates on uh, changes we're making to on the park bench. Um, we're looking to explore some new days for webinars. Uh, this is not exclusive to our typical uh, Tuesday at noon option. So let us know if there are different times uh, and or days that work better for you. Um, we're also looking at additional formats, uh, to diversify uh, what we're doing, adding uh, single person interviews, different types of presentations to, uh, to create variety in our panel formats. We're also looking uh, to highlight and to continue to highlight new voices in the new urbanist movement, as well as bring in voices from outside to expand upon uh, our uh, perspectives. And then looking inward, we're going to continue to reassess and adapt based on feedback from all of you, as well as make uh, some internal checks to make sure that we're on the right path. We also have then lined up uh, two webinars uh, that we uh, welcome you to join us in in the upcoming weeks. This is uh, on Wednesday, August 12th, we'll have housing affordability and access. And on Tuesday, August 25th, we'll have equity driven planning. And uh, you can register for those um, on the website you see below. I'm sure they'll be appearing shortly there. Uh, and we'll send out uh, messages well in advance to remind you as well. So today I'd like to introduce our four panelists we have joining us here today. Uh, do note that at least two of them are currently in the periphery or near center of a hurricane. So if we lose someone, uh, that's what's happened. Uh, first, we'll hear from Norman Garrick. Norman Garrick is a professor of civil engineering at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Garrick is also a former member of the National Board of CNU and the CNU Fellow. He specializes in planning and design of urban transportation systems, including transit, streets, street networks, parking, bicycle, and pedestrian facilities. His research and writings have reached a wide audience through outlets such as the Washington Post, the Denver Post, and the Hartford Currents. The Atlantic City Lab, Atlantic, the Atlantic City Lab, Plan Edison, New Urban News, Streets Blog, and Street Film. Dr. Garrick has also worked as a transportation consultant on numerous design charrettes, including urban revitalization projects at the Prince of Wales Foundation in Kingston, Jamaica, and in Freetown, Sierra Leone. We'll then hear from Gary Toth. Gary has 47 years of experience in managing and directing organizations involved with shaping the built form of our communities in a more inclusive and equitable manner. He currently splits his time between a senior placemaker at the Project for Public Spaces and his own consulting business. He has an extensive knowledge of street network design principles and is one of the leading U.S. experts on how to reframe measures of effectiveness to create solutions that support broad goals, not just high-speed transportation. He has worked with dozens of communities 
and 15 state transportation departments to help them reshape transportation investment. Having worked with and for the Project for Public Spaces for 20 years, he understands how to use placemaking to achieve these goals. We've been here as our third speaker uh, from Moore Marshall. Mr. Marshall specializes in analyzing the relationships between the built environment and travel behavior and doing planning that coordinates multimodal transportation with land use and community needs. He has managed transportation projects in over 30 U.S. states, including projects for the U.S. government and state transportation departments, metropolitan planning organizations, cities, and public interest groups. And then last, we'll hear from Lucy Toole, a transportation engineer based in Tool Design, or Lucy Gibson, I'm sorry, a transportation engineer based in Tool Design's Boston office, where she has worked for two years. Lucy has worked on projects across the country that focus on the planning and design of streets, corridors, and intersections that create safe and vibrant places for people. Her clients include cities, towns, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations that share goals of more efficient, sustainable, and enjoyable transportation networks that consider everyone's safety. She's currently working on transformational street design projects in Boston, Cambridge, New Haven, Providence and Burlington, Vermont. Lucy has worked with the Congress for the New Urbanism on several of their highways boulevards projects, including ones in Buffalo, Seattle, and New Orleans. So with those introductions, I'll now turn it over to Norman Gerrick, uh, who will be our first speaker of the day. Each panelist, if you're not familiar with our format, will talk for about five to seven minutes, offering their perspectives. And then we'll use the remaining time for questions and answers. Um, you can chat your questions to us using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll relay them to our panelists. So thank you all for joining us today. Good morning. Greetings from Hurricane Country. I hope we'll be able to stay with you for the duration. Um, good morning. Uh, what I want to talk to you today about is um, the role of transportation as it affects ur urban planning. And I wanted to start out with an image that I think dram dramatically demonstrates what it is we are here for and why we need to be here. So I don't know if any of you recognize this city. Um, you probably, some of you might have been here but you probably don't recognize the city because it no longer stands in this form anymore. This is Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, this is an image that we created a few years ago. One of my grad students recreated from the sandboard maps this image of Bridgeport to show just what an intact, vibrant city it was at the time. Um, and it really is meant to show just how much cities have changed in the era of the automobile. So this is what Bridgeport looks like now. And you, it's an absolutely devastating image to think that we went from this to this in just 100, well, in just 50 years time. Um, and you think, what does this have to do with transportation? Well, for me, this is almost as if we dropped a transportation bomb on the city of Bridgeport. Um, a lot of it was wiped out for parking, for the two freeways in the middle of the city, et cetera. Um, Bridgeport went, almost went bankrupt a few years ago. And this map, uh, this image tells you why. The only taxpayers in this image are the buildings in blue. Nothing else pays taxes. So this is what we're faced with. This is what we're trying to confront as urbanists. Um, in terms of what the transportation system has done, in terms of trying to reverse some of these damages and to start to um, recreate or create places that have more vibrancy, more life, pay more taxes, etc. So I'm going to start, um, well, and another um, impact of this um, transportation system that we have created is what has happened in terms of the amount of driving, and you can see how it increased starting in uh, around 1908 with the coming of the Model T. And you, you can see major events in the history of the country writ large on this graph, the Great Depression, 
World War um, II. Um, and then after the, the war, we just kept going up and up a little deep for the um, first uh, Gulf crisis in 1973 um, and for the second one in 1978. And then we just continued going. Um, and one of the things that is interesting about this graph for me is that we, the United States, is um, one of the few countries in the world that is at this level of automobility. Um, um, we, we see where German is, um, is about a third, uh, um, Canada is about two thirds of the US level, Germany is about half, and Japan is about a third. These are all automobile producing countries. So we are really extraordinary in terms of what we have done in terms of transportation planning. And we can also see all the other impacts in this graph um, that are associated with this run up in, um, in, dri in driving. So um, climate, the use of petroleum, emissions, but the one I'm going to focus on, I'm just going to focus on in my presentation today is this issue of fatalities. So I want to start the story by a trip or a sabbatical I took in 2004 when I went to live in Davis, California. And I went there because I wanted to understand how an American city was able to get 22% of people to ride to work. And I was just getting into this field, so I was really naive. And the thing that struck me while I was in Davis was this um, one fact, the fact that the traffic fatality rate was extremely low in Davis. And to me, the two things didn't go together. How was, was it that they had such a high biking rate and at the same time, such a low traffic fatality rate. So when I came back to, the, um, to Connecticut, I almost said to the US, um, I did an investigation and this is what I found. Um, the rate of um, traffic fatality in California city ranged from zero to 17 per 100,000, a tremendous rate range. And Davis was number three. Davis was um, one of the lowest. And so I started to think, why? What could be the reason for this? And one of the things I found out immediately was that there was a difference between older cities and newer cities. So I found that older cities had much lower rate of traffic fatality than newer cities in California. And this seemed really puzzling because you would think that the methods that we had, the design approaches, et cetera, should be produced in safer places rather than less safe places. So I broke down the data even more, and I found that for pedestrians, there was a difference, um, a huge difference for pedestrians, for bike riders, and even for people in car. And the difference was about 42%, the risk of fatality in these older cities versus the newer cities for pedestrians, about 40% for people on bikes, and he, even for people in vehicles, they, there was this huge difference in fatality outcomes in the older versus the newer cities. So again, these cities, the older cities were created before we had the methodologies from Ashto and the newer cities after. So why were these um, given us? Why, were the, why was the ASHTO design standards given us such different outcomes? Um, and one of the things that immediately came to mind was it had to do with speeds because you've all seen these results which showed that at 20 miles per hour, the chance of being killed if you're a pedestrian is only 5%, at 30 miles per hour, it goes up to 45%. And at 40 miles per hour, it goes up to 85%. So we thought that maybe this is where we should be looking to find the answers. So first we thought of looking at street design and we didn't really go down that line intently, intensely. We instead decided to look at something else because we also found that there was a vast difference between 
the street network design of the older and the newer cities. Um, and so we decided to look into how we went from creating places that look like this, Washington DC, versus creating places that look like this, almost anywhere suburbia in America. And what we found, well, obviously, um, this suburbia America is a function of a very deliberate way of approach. It's um, tied to something called ashto functional classification, which um, defines roads as arterials, collectors, and roads, and local roads. And this is exactly what you see here. You can define very clearly the, the distinction. Whereas if you went to Washington DC, there is no such distinction. Um, there is a different hierarchy, but it's not I, I'm defined in the same way that Ashton does. So one of the things we found out was that we, we decided to do a study of, a more detailed study of 24 cities in California to try to understand how the street networks matter and what we found was that, this is a, 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 a very short summary of what we found, that when you looked at patterns like these, we found that the chance of being badly injured in these cul-de-sac, ashtotype um, patterns was 30% higher than the older connected street networks. The chance of being killed was 50% higher. So um, since that time, I've gone on to do a lot of work trying to understand the difference in traffic fatality between the US and um, countries in Europe, countries around the world. And coming out of the study is the understanding of how far we are falling behind in terms of traffic safety. Um, this was the last study we did looking at traffic fatalities the US versus the Netherlands. Um, you can see what happened pre-1970. Both countries had an, an uptick, a uh, rise in traffic fatality. But after 1970, we see a, a steady decrease in the US, and we see this almost total falling off of traffic fatality going towards um, vision zero in the Netherlands. And so we've been very fascinated about what um, constitutes the difference between these two countries, what they've been doing and why there is such a difference in outcomes. Coming from a place where they started at parity and going to a place where they're so different in terms of their traffic outcomes. So this is what um, fatality rates for different users look like. You can see in the US, it's much, much more dangerous to be on foot or on bike compared to being in a vehicle. You see, um, and this was in 1970. You see the same pattern in the Netherlands in 1970 but the, dis the um, difference was not as large as it was in the US. Moving to 2015, the situation has got somewhat better for people in cars. In the US, it has actually gotten worse for people on foot in the US and somewhat slightly better for people on bike. But this is nothing to be proud of. This is what the Netherlands looks like now. This is the vast difference in terms of outcome. And one of the things that struck me about this graph is that being on foot or being on bike in the Netherlands is almost as safe. In fact, it is as safe as being in a vehicle. And to me, that's an incredible, almost miraculous outcome compares to where we are in the US. So um, I started thinking about how we talk about traffic safety in the US. And one of the things we like um, when we are um, being um, politically correct or being advanced, we talk about the need to protect vulnerable road users. And I first saw that term used by a British planner, Stephen Plowden, in a book called 
Towns Against Traffic, and he talks about the need for armor, taken to the street with armor to protect ourselves from traffic. So this is how I envisage that pedestrians or bikers would need to go if they're gonna be safe on our streets. Um, so this is where that has gotten us, and this is where the Netherlands is. And what I found is that the approach in the Netherlands is actually totally different. In the US, the onus is largely on people, is largely on wearing helmets, it's largely on not being distracted, etc. The differences in the Netherlands is that they have decided to create places that are safe for people, for all people, not just for people in vehicles, not just for people that are helmeted, but for all people, small people, big people, etc. And the way they've done that is very intentional, and you can see the difference in those two pictures. This is what that street looked like in, 19, in the 1960s in the Netherlands. A car sewer, which we're used to in the US, and this is what it looks like now. So they have developed a procedure, a policy of design that is about creating places that are people-centric rather than trying to get cars moving. And I won't get into the details, but this was a battle. We go to the Netherlands and we see what is going on there now and we think it happened by magic or because these people are special or these people are different, but it took a fight. And one of the um, slogans that stuck in my mind is this idea of stopping the child murder, um, which, which is, uh, this is an image of the, those demonstrations. Um, this is an image of a die-in by the, the Reich Museum in Amsterdam. So this used to be a highway, is now a pedestrian way in the city. So um, what we are talking about here, for in, in my mind anyway, is this need to continue this cultural change that we have started in the US until maybe we get to the point where we can turn car streets like this one used to be in the Netherlands into a street that is for tram and that is for bikes that supports the, um, the goals of urbanism, that supports the goals of lower car use, et cetera. So that is all I have. And I think, and now Gary will um, take you into some of the other issues that are needed to change and to, to, um, to advance this, this culture change. So thank you very much for your attention. So Norman, you have to unshare your screen. At the bottom. Okay. Um, hey Gary, it actually looks like Norman's screen is unshared, so you should be good to go. Yes. All right. Can you see my screen? No, cannot see it. I have three, like, three things here. But it should be a little green button at the bottom where it says share screen. No yeah, screen. I'm, um, All right, you should see it now, right? Yep. See it. Okay. So, riffing off of what Norman was talking about. <clears throat> oh, Gary, I'm sorry. We actually can't see it anymore. For some reason, it disappeared. Let me see if I can. Your, move it. your screen is on. It's just the PowerPoint, I think, went over to another yeah. screen of yours. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can see the PowerPoint screen. Um, All right, I'm gonna leave it in this mode because when I hit, I can't control where it goes. Um, 
All right, so riffing off of what Norman was talking about, um, this goes back, well, before the, the dawn of the automobile, transportation was about supporting community, moving goods and people were just really part of that mission. Everything went back to the community and engineers worked side by side with everyone in community building. And then we fell in love with the automobile and the problem that engineers were asked to solve that changed. And so Norman, you know, as you talk about ASHTO and functional classification, you know, and the engineers and transportation people were doing basically what our country asked them to, to build roads. And it was a militaristic thing happening after World War II, right? A lot of military people in, in transportation. And they were told to focus on the objective. Forget about community building, forget about environmental problems, forget about everything else. Um, build those roads and build them damn fast. And so they did. And there's the standards that you're talking about, the functional classification, um, high speed, level of service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Arguably, it may have been not so bad if in the 60s, um, happy with the safety record of the interstates, Congress asked the engineers to apply this to urban arterials. And that's where you started getting the carving up of our cities that you saw that you depicted in Bridgeport. But the answer I think is this, we are problem solvers, give us a new problem to solve. So instead of building, um, we should be building communities through transportation. This is the way it was prior to the dawn of the automobile, um, even in the early 20th, 20th century, building around train stations, building around rivers, everything was walkable. And instead, the freedom offered by the automobile allowed us to separate everything into all these different uses. And this is where everything broke down and caused the problems that Norman was talking about. So the way out then is to work with our transportation people and figure out again how to partner with them to um, give us the kind of roads that we go back to where we're safe, we're comfortable, and we have livable communities. The way to do that, I think, is yes, they're very frustrating. Um, the, the transportation people are, um, they're getting better in a lot of cities, for instance, but um, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And so the temptation to attack them has to be put aside, I think, if we want to get anywhere. I think we have to do our homework, define the problem, right? We too often will give, go and ask for a, a new traffic light or a crosswalk or something, and the transportation people will give us 18 reasons why it can't be done. Instead, let's put their skills to use, to find the problem, not the solution. Remember, we're problem solvers, uh, engineers in particular are problem solvers. And so do your homework, to find the problem, and, um, and we can get somewhere. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Norm Marshall and Lucy, who will talk about some of the specifics of um, how to problem solve. Okay, thank you, Gary. Is my screen showing? Yep. Great. Um, so I'm building on, I think, both of what Norman and Gary talked about. I'm going to talk about proper analysis of urban freeway expansion and downsizing. So our freeway system in our cities is, as Norman showed in Bridgeport, this horrible legacy. And in some places, we are trying to the engineers are working to try to downsize these facilities, but in too many places, we're still working on expanding. And uh, so I'm going to talk about, um, unfortunately, a fairly typical example in, in, that's using Little Rock, Arkansas. So Little Rock is um, among the, along the southern end of the um, Arkansas River here. We have North Little Rock and other areas to the north. There are five bridges across the Arkansas River already. Three of them are six lane interstates, I-30 downtown and two essentially beltway bridges. And just kind of regionally to think about this, I-30 is basically a road that goes from Dallas to Memphis. 
Well, except you have to use I-40 to get on to Memphis. So there is some interstate travel, but like most interstate highways in urban areas, this road primarily serves local traffic, uh, particularly during the peak periods. And then when we look downtown, we also see in addition to I-30 here, we also have two street bridges crossing the river. So there's really a lot of crossing the river. The other two bridges, this is an old railroad bridge that serves pedestrians now, and this is an existing railroad bridge. We have this big interchange downtown, the Clinton uh, Presidential Libraries to the east here, which would be a kind of nice tie-in with the downtown, which is right now going under, you have to walk under a horrible highway. And of course, what the engineers want to do is take this horrible six lane highway and turn it into a 12 lane highway, as you see here. Um, now, in studying this, what they notice is in the peak period, I-30 is congested uh, southbound in the morning and uh, northbound in the evening. And therefore, they think it needs to be widening. They think the congestion is a sign that you need to be widening. So they draw typically what they always do, unfortunately, and the engineers typically do is they draw a boundary around the way they see the problem. They see the problem as, you know, what do we do with I-30 to make it move more cars faster? And they don't take into account all the bigger issues here. They don't account for diversion between the different bridges. They don't consider the induced travel effects outside the study area. And they very much do not consider any impacts on downtown Little Rock. And in addition, although I can't really get into it deeply today because of the time, their model algorithms are outdated and inaccurate. So rather than show their modeling results, their modeling results always say that if they don't widen this, congestion is going to be horrible. And if they do widen it, things will be so much better. I'm just going to show you, I've been able to model this myself for local clients, and I'll show you what really would happen. So uh, their base year was 2010, uh, and their analysis year was 2040. So if we look at just the widening, the 12 lane project versus leaving at six lanes, we see that we get uh, increase in traffic either way. This is, this is uh, stacking all the bridges together. But when we do the no build, most of the growth in traffic is going to be on those two beltway bridges because that's where the, the extra peak period capacity is. If you widen it, most of the increase is going to be on I-30. So you're actually just moving traffic that would otherwise be on these beltway bridges and moving it downtown. There's a slight increase in overall traffic too because of induced travel. But what you really do then by moving all this traffic onto I-30 and encouraging people to use that rather than the Beltway bridges or these downtown bridges, you create all this additional congestion on downtown Little Rock because you have this flow of people trying to get to uh, this big interchange on I-30 and you also still have some people trying to get north across these and it just doesn't work. This is an area in here where the um, buildings are right up to the sidewalks and you know you can't really widen these streets to make them like a highway to accommodate this but if we think back to that little graphic i showed earlier this is outside their study area so this is not something they're concerned about to the extent that that's a problem at all that's going to be the city's problem <clears throat> my clients also uh, wanted me to look at a boulevard alternative so rather than widening from six lanes to 12 lanes, we remove the freeway completely and put in a six lane boulevard. And as part of that, we also put in a fourth bridge downtown, which is something that's been under discussion a long time and thinking some of that money could be used over here. And it would really work better with the grid showing, for example, that graphic Gary showed about using transportation to connect communities. This western part of downtown Little Rock is depressed and could really benefit from this for economic development. And when we do this, we get slightly less overall traffic because we don't have this induced travel effect. We carry roughly the same amount of cars downtown, but now we have four bridges instead of three, but none of them are freeway bridges. And again, the growth in traffic's on the beltways. And I won't really get into the details here, except to say that regionally, when you really model it correctly, there's no benefit in either regional um, travel time to the 12 lane alternative, you actually do slightly better with the 2040 Boulevard alternative. So I do have uh, materials on my website, smartmobility.com. 
And now I'll turn it on to Lucy. Turn it over to Lucy if I can unshare here. Thanks. So it's great to be here. And uh, as you can see from what Norm talked about, the regional uh, planning and the way we think about infrastructure and how it will be used is really important to what our streets look like. And then I'm going to drill down a little more into the specific neighborhood and corridor and intersection level of what kinds of changes we need to put in our thinking about how we design things. One of the big challenges we have is that, especially when you're drilling down to a certain street, there's been, since we started the auto era, what we call a predict and provide basis for design, where we have to forecast demand and then build enough for it. And this has been practiced again and again as if traffic was like an amount of water that was going to be coming through a pipe and we had to accommodate it no matter what. And the whole principles of traffic engineering really were focused on, you know, carrying the water that's coming. In fact, traffic is really malleable and adaptable and responds to the infrastructure we build. So we can really design our streets for the right amount of traffic that we want, not for some amount of traffic that's coming at us. Um, the way the, the paradigm is. We have actually a lot of control in our design and looking at the whole network design of how much traffic is the right amount of traffic and what we want to design for. So we really have to change the focus from traffic engineering to what we call urban mobility engineering, where we look at getting as much exchange, as much activity in an urban downtown as we can with as few traffic trips actually as possible. We want to get more walking and biking to get the right mix of activity and economy and activity that we want to see in our cities. Um, we need to do principles-based design, not quantitative design. One of the things that tool design has been a leader in is promoting a, a new paradigm for design of the, based on the new ease of transportation rather than engineering and whatnot. It's ethics, equity, and empathy need to be the focus of our design and streets. So if your community, like many of ours, is faced with a either unwanted project that's going to improve a road and by widening it, or there's an opportunity to take advantage of funding to redesign a street, um, you really have to start right from the beginning and defining what are the objectives of your project. Is it um, accommodating traffic or is it accommodating a city and building a city with urban mobility? Um, so thinking about the right problems to solve, the key ones are safety above everything else. And again, as Norm said, safety for um, vulnerable users should be the guiding star. And, you know, and then the ethics comes in in a way that we should never compromise somebody's safety for somebody else's convenience to be able to drive through quickly. So these are like fundamental um, principles to bring to traffic engineers that might care to listen that you're talking to in your community. Another important component that should be more part of our traffic and street design is resiliency. And this can be everything from resiliency to climate change, where we need more trees planted, we need less pavement, to resilient networks that provide a lot of different options that are more resilient to an incident or a flood or crash or any other kind of issues that are gonna happen, or maybe a street closure for a festival. We wanna, really avoid having to design for unrealistic forecasts. So examples of this abound where even in cities today that like, for example, we're working in the city of New Haven, they have great goals of shifting the modes. They're already underway. It's already starting to happen away from auto towards biking, walking and transit. They have an opportunity to redesign State Street. In fact, Robert Orr has a great piece on this and his website if you're familiar with his work. The Connecticut DOT requires a forecast of um, half a percent per year in any downtown area. That's their urban forecast. And when you look at the streets we have in our cities, they're narrow, they're limited, often the sidewalks aren't wide enough. Why should we be planning for perpetual growth? You know, really becomes exponential growth when you add half a percent per year, per year, over year. And so we really have to think about forecasts differently. And the Forecasts that you're designing for should be the amount of traffic you want to see in your downtown, the right size, the right amount of traffic. And in this case of New Haven, we will analyze what the streets look like in that other scenario where we have, you know, 10% traffic growth over 20 years. But 
we're going to describe that as that that's the scenario if, if we fail, if the city fails to do the mode shift, that's the worst case scenario. It's not what we're planning for. It's not the goal of the design. And so really shifting, you know, what is the forecast that you're planning for versus, you know, what, what's a worst case scenario that might happen. And when we report that and discuss, you know, how does the traffic going to work, we'll have a different um, basis for discussing this. Um, intersection operations are, you know, where a lot of the um, details get into play of how people live and how they experience the street. And there's a lot of changes in engineering practices that are relatively easy that we can bring into uh, the design to make it work better really for everyone. So examples of this are at the network level, networks of skinny streets that are more frequently spaced and two-way operations to allow the efficient routing, you know, the get the most amount of exchange for the least amount of traffic and the least amount of vehicle miles traveled. For signalized intersections, keeping cycle lengths short has a huge beneficial effect for safety in particular. Um, the more frequently a pedestrian phase is called, people will wait for the phase and not try to wait out in traffic because of a long wait. Cars that are driving to an intersection in a short cycle length if they know that the light's going to come green again, not very long time, there's a lot less aggressive driving, a lot less stakes in trying to make the green light. And all those kind of things um, really help improve safety by keeping things slow, keep people, keep people keeping aware of their surroundings because speed is really the, the most important criterion safety as you heard from Norman. Um, ge intersection geometry is important. There's a lot of right turn lanes that you might see in urban networks and they should all be removed pretty much. You can pretty much make a blanket statement. We want to keep people moving slowly. So when you have a right turn lane that a car turning right gets out of the through lane into their right turn lane, you're losing an opportunity to slow down everyone behind you and keep the speeds at a more safe and reasonable level by having them follow the right turning car till it makes its turn. So every opportunity like that to keep things slower, reinforce that safe speed of 20 miles an hour or so is really important. And there's another important thing about transportation projects. They're by and large all funded by public, with public funds, either cities or state DOTs. And there's a lot of opportunity for public input. And so I think what we have to do as new urbanists is make sure we keep voicing the right design approach, the right principles to be using, the right way to think about forecasts and planning at every step in a project when we have opportunities for public comment. There are a lot of younger engineers, thanks to Norman Garrick and Wes Marshall and Peter Firth and some of the other great leaders that we have in uh, new paradigms of transportation engineering, and they're filtering through the system. So they'll, you know, there will be a lot of people at DOTs that will listen and that will, you know, be able to bring this into projects over time. It's going to take time, but it, it will happen. We're already seeing a lot of glimmers of it and we just have to keep at it and keep, keep up the education um, on how we have to really change our paradigm of how we plan. And that's all I have. So I think we can go to questions and. All right, thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, yeah, we can go to questions now. And if you have any questions uh, that you haven't asked yet, uh, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll also switch to see all of our panelists. You'll notice Gary's lost power, but the show must go on. He is uh, with us still. Um, yeah, so as those questions are filtering in, um, let's see, I just like to ask one, I think, um, Norman, you sort of made it clear that the designs that we're using have, have failed. Um, and Lucy, I think you talked about this a little bit too, but what, what's our path to get to better designs? Is there a way to work within functional classification? Um, and maybe this is where you were going, Gary, if you want to elaborate a little bit on this too, you know, um, saying a little bit more about what you mean about solving the problem rather than offering the solution uh, uh, up front. Well, I'll chime in at first. Can you see me here? <laughs> um, yeah, you're good. 
you know, everything that we need to design can be designed within the existing design standards, the existing pattern of functional classification, the existing pattern of level of service. Um, Norm Marshall and I and another associate have been working on a project in a place that shall remain nameless right now. But, you know, we've been basically telling them the same thing, which is the high speed auto oriented karma of the place um, isn't required by the standards. It's, re it's an interpretation of the standards. So um, we can do pretty much everything that we wanna do within the existing rules and regulations. I would echo that. And there's some great guidance coming out. Uh, there's the ITE CNU guide to walkable thoroughfares. NATRO is just an incredible, helpful resource. And none of that really conflicts with ASHTO. ASHTO kind of leaves things up in the air for cities. There's not a level of service standard. There is a lot more flexibility in ASHTO. It's just that it wasn't defined what you do, <laughs> what the right way to do it is with NACHO and a lot of other newer guides do bring in. So having that to bring to a DOT and say, this is the right way to design a city. It's not just me saying this, it's NACHO. That really provides great, um, education opportunity and cover. I agree with all of that, but I, you know, as an educator, I think we should not be teaching something that is so fundamentally flawed. I, I think it really limits how far we can go if we don't have systems and concepts in place that are based in reality and not based in some imaginary way that the world should operate. And I, and I think it is true that we, we have made and we will continue to make progress, but we also need to understand that there are fundamental problems with the system that we have in place now also that we need to get to, that we need to solve. Yeah, Norman, I'm not trying to say that there's not fundamental problems. Um, I think that the fundamental problems are in how we're applying the, the rules and the system. Um, it's the it's the bias towards high speed transportation that is really the problem. Um, you know, when I was back at New Jersey DOT about 15 years ago, we um, partnered with Pennsylvania DOT to develop something called the Smart Transportation Guide for Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And so we conducted outreach to communities in both of the states and asked them for you know, what were, what were the characteristics of livable cities, livable, livable street design, livable transportation design that they wanted. And we found a way to accomplish them all within, uh, except for one, there was one standard in Pennsylvania, I forget which one it was, where they had to change their design manual. But it, it's, it's just a, it's a mindset. It's a philosophy that roads have to be big and fast that is dominating this. Yes, and it, it, it definitely is something that, um, it, that's not where, necessarily where you start, but I, I, I really don't think that you can fundamentally um, get to where we need to without acknowledging that the system on which everything is built is flawed. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think that is without a doubt the case, but it, it means really um, breaking apart what it is we're trying to do and, and develop a system that works for that. And I think this is getting to some of the questions that are filtering in a little bit around uh, a culture of driving um, and looking at ways to promote a more balanced um, transportation ecosystem. Um, we, have, we have one question here from uh, Samantha uh, asking, uh, what recommendations would be uh, for growing communities to, ingre to increase diverse mobility? This includes biking, walking, and driving. So, so it's not, I say, you know, a complete divestment from cars uh, from a design perspective. Um, and Samantha is also a little curious, and this is also an interesting perspective too, looking um, at existing rural growing into a more urban uh, area. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, one of the problems that most um, 
uh, every place that's been constructed since 1950 have done is they didn't do an adequate job of building a network of streets. So that this again does go back to Asho. The idea was if you put in an arterial street every mile, and then that was really the only way to get from one point to another and everything else was kind of little cul-de-sacs and things, that that was an efficient way to move cars. That's a deadly place for people to be pedestrians. And, but it's very hard to get those areas retrofitted because you didn't provide that space. When we look at something like Bridgeport, uh, that's a traditional city. It had a very dense uh, set of little streets. And those little streets can accommodate all uses at slow speeds. And so, uh, you know, preserve any amount of right of way you can. These are small streets. These are not like huge spaces that you need, but you really need a network. Otherwise, you don't have a, a safe place for all modes. And I think there's a, something about the hierarchy of the network. The functional classification assumes roads get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what we actually know in looking details at traffic engineering is that larger intersections are less efficient. You have a diminishing returns as you add a lane. Each new lane it can handle less traffic. And that's as intersections get larger, you have more time that you need to have yellow and all red lights for traffic to clear. So you get less efficiency. And then when you have to allow pedestrians to cross at the appropriate, give them enough time, that takes up more time. And so we, the network of skinny streets can just outperform the big uh, major arterials easily. And how we get back to that is, a, is yeah, one of the fundamental challenges, but it's about connectivity. And I think bringing in the idea of resiliency is something that gets a lot of people interested. We have more different streets. So if one is closed, we have others to be able to use is something that's appealing to a lot of public officials. So uh, a few other questions are looking at some more of the nitty gritty of, of design. Um, and so I'll sort of, I'll collect them into a single question. Uh, but what are all your thoughts on what the smallest thing you can do in your community with regards to transportation uh, that will have the largest impact? Um, I think the, the, small, the most fundamental thing you can do is to start looking at parking because it is so, it's easy to understand the impact of parking once you start looking at it. Um, counting parking, um, using parking for other purposes, et cetera. Um, parking is a driver of um, induction of traffic, but parking is also a killer of urban um, character, urban spaces, et cetera. Um, and almost every single place in America has too much parking. So you can start, and that's what we're seeing during the pandemic is that people are beginning to recognize just how much valuable land is in parking. And you see in lots of places repurposing the parking for um, other uses. So I think that's where I would recommend people start looking. I completely agree with Norman. I think another thing we can do, and people are doing it more, get out and walk and bike and don't drive. The safest places for people walking and biking are where a lot of people are walking and biking. It's not necessarily the infrastructure. It's more about the expectation of drivers that they need to share the street and be aware and alert of people walking and biking. So I'm sure a lot of us do that already, but um, getting out there, encouraging your friends or neighbors that may not walk or bike all the time. Um, and parking is a great way to <laughs> encourage it too by making less of it available. I guess I'll just make another plug too that whenever there's a transportation project, get familiar with it, make comments, send letters to your decision makers about what you see as the right way to approach it and what are the right considerations. And some of them will ignore it, but some will listen and it'll give them some um, both vocabulary and ability to speak up for their constituents. You can also push for right sizing or road diets of a lot of the big arterials, um, there's a lot of excess capacity 
in the system, particularly during the off peak. And um, so in, for instance, in my town, um, something like that was done. It took 15 years to accomplish, but it helps make your town more livable. So going from the small to the big, um, there's a question here uh, about uh, federal transportation policy, and that's sort of informed, uh, you know, particularly a lot of these large highways that are built through cities. Um, if you all had recommendations for what sort of programs could be put in place at the federal level to help create uh, more walkable places, a more balanced transportation ecosystem, what would they be? Well, some of them were the, the during the Obama administration, um, they were about to embark on a program to come back and do um, undo a lot of the damage that our freeways and interstates did in the cities. Um, you know, freeway teardowns and um, freeways to boulevards and, um, you know, money put in to reconnect the grid and to foster biking and walking. Um, so in the next administration, that would be something to lobby for, to get that back. I, I agree strongly with that. Unfortunately, I think uh, much of what has been spent on freeway expansion since about 1990 has been worse than useless. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, whenever they, we talk about infrastructure spending, all these projects that are ready to go, many of these are just horrible projects. And so, you know, uh, we really need to refocus what we're doing again. And uh, you know, there were some good steps during the Obama administration. I think that some requirements that cities or regions have to define a vision of what they want for the future, and most of them want more biking, walking, transit, less reliance on cars, less emissions, and require that that be considered in the design instead of be kind of an exception to the predict and provide. And it kind of gets to what Norman was saying. We need a whole new system. We need a new paradigm for how is our network going to function and how do we then go about rebuilding it. Well, you know, I'm looking at in the in the Q&A pod, something that Hayden Walker put about I-35 and Austin widening to 18 lanes. And that's just typical of the whole mentality that we're ultimately going to solve the problem with roadway widening. And it gets back to what I was trying to say in my presentation, that the focus of transportation has to go back to building communities through transportation instead of transportation through communities. That's what we have to lobby for. It'll require a fundamental change in a lot of the state DOTs, but I wouldn't dismantle them. I would repurpose them. They've got all the skills and innovation. Um, we just have to get them to, to do the right stuff. So this, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I'll go with this one because on the park bench started as a response to uh, new urbanists response to uh, the pandemic. Um, so how has travel during the pandemic that, you know, it started initially, uh, we saw a, a large reduction in commutes. We're now seeing travel uh, in personal automobiles tick back up in public transit or flatlining, um, how has travel during the pandemic changed uh, what, uh, how you can interact with transportation planners and, and transportation officials? And well, so, uh, so, go ahead, Lucy. Oh, some of the um, official directives we get from our clients is they just assume it's going to go back to where it was, which is very disheartening. And I think that, you know, so we're still planning for the same kind of traffic that they might have forecast pre-COVID. Um, I think there's a real need, maybe this is something federal <laughs> legislation could mandate too, that we have to look at other scenarios. I think the COVID time has given us an opportunity to, to question some of our precepts and um, principles. And um, the, uh, the more advanced cities are actually taking advantage, you, you're seeing 
ma massive changes in places like Oakland and in places like Paris and Milan that are ma um, putting in place major plans, things that they've been doing incremental over time to make the cities become more bike pedestrian friendly. We're seeing that being sped up by some of the changes in the COVID time. But there are also other issues. There are so many things going on that it's really complex um, to, to think about where we're going to end up in five years time. Um, there are other things like, are people going to be willing to use public transit, for example, um, in next year or the year after that. The evidence suggests in places like Hong Kong, which went through viruses like this before, that we do, they do go back to normal in terms of the use of transit, in terms of the use of the urban spaces, etc. But I don't know. I mean, the experience that we are having in the U.S. now is unlike anywhere else, um, except maybe if you talk about Brazil or Russia. Um, so it's really hard to, to say <laughs> what's going to happen next year, the year after that, et cetera. Well, we hit our 1 p.m. Uh, end. Uh, is there any final thoughts from, from all of you? Uh, this? So um, there's a comment here that we uh, we uh, see a new types of over um, estimated the possibility for changes, and I would just like to say that the changes that have occurred over the last 20 years since ICT in 1993 is amazing. I don't think um, some of the, the the design changes that we're seeing now, the in, encouraging in biking. In, in American cities. It was not imaginary. Im, um, it's something we could not imagine even 20 years ago. So I have a lot of faith that things can change in the US. I continue to change because we have seen a lot of change just in the 20 years that I've been working with Gary and um, Lucy and Norm. So let's have faith. <laughs> yeah, we've seen change in certain places and so the fact that we advocated for it does not mean we're we're blind to the fact that there is a lot of places that yet still need to be enlightened, um, particularly at the state levels. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, I know we have a few outstanding questions and I'll see particularly around getting uh, materials and studies that you all have done. I'll see about if I can get that from you all and put it up on our on the Park Bench page so folks have access to it. Um, thank you to our presenters today for their excellent job and thank you all for attending. Um, and I'll remind everyone to be on the lookout for our uh, next on the Park Bench um, uh, registration invite, I believe, is posted at the beginning of our chat. Uh, so enjoy your Tuesday and uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Take care.